Monopoly that we played, they gave us bogus money and we used bogus money and we used chips. And we were given a certain amount of dollars. And we told, okay, now your Congress, you are going to buy these dollars that we gave you and you're going to buy an airplane. You're going to build the airplane and you're going to fly the airplane and you're going to want spare parts and you're going to want to be able to repair these on the ships and everything. So split the amount of money that we're going to give you for that airplane up. So suddenly you had to figure out, well, how much R&D do we do that we give to the manufacturer and what's he going to charge us and how much of that money then are we going to have left after we do all the testing and flights and stuff and we tell him to build it how much money will be left after he builds it so we can buy the airplanes the more airplanes we buy from him the cheaper the cost the more money he uses in development and the more complex the less money that will be left for purchasing the black boxes and the more training is going to be involved in the eye level and the more repair work that's going to be required at the depot. So all of this had to be worked out by Congress and the Navy and fortunately, the Air Force was the first to try it. So they developed what they called the NAMP, the Naval Air Maintenance Plan. I got it finally. The Naval Air Maintenance Plan was edicted to us as the NAMP. We had to live within that guidance. And the NAMP said what the squadron could do what the depot would do, what the intermediate facility on the ship or shore would do, and what the intermediate facility on the ship could do. So we learned a lot from the Air Force. And thank God we did, because I don't think the Navy would have ever progressed into it, because to start with, we didn't have the organization that the new Air Force was privileged with. Remember, they didn't come along till 1947. They had SAC. SAC could order almost anything they want in any way they wanted. They had TAC, which went out and fought the battles. So SAC and TAT had big guns into the pot of money. And they set themselves up. Sack says, we are God. Anything we do, and remember now, Sack was a strategic air command. They dictated whether we would go to war or how or start the war or whatever. They also were responsible for all the B-52s and everything that came along and ensured the safety of the United States. So the SAC had a big part. TAC had to bite a smaller piece of the money. They could only get the money they had to actually fight the war. And they had to buy the airplanes and stuff that were uh, uh, their allowance authorized them to get through R&D. So all these pots of money had to be approved by Congress. So instead of Congress and saying, okay, we're going to have 15 different types of fighters built in the mid-50s, we are going to have to pare down to the jet age and have some say in what we can build and how many we can have because the jet age is expensive. So... The Navy never got everything they wanted, but they got a better system. They got a better maintenance system. They got another 
most of the aircraft we got, we worked the bugs out of until we get the F-111, which is another story. But it took us a big learning chunk all through the 50s to learn what we really wanted. And all through the early 60s to perfect what we wanted and what we had and what we got. So it was a stage of life that was different from the first five and six years that I was in the Navy because five, four years of it was spent at North Island in the ferry squadron, learning a maintenance procedure and flying around, fixing airplanes. In the, from 1956 to 57, I spent in the classroom. And then in 57, I had time to be in a active squadron, making deployments and learning how to use that aircraft in combat. And then in 1956, I'll take that back, 1976, we got involved, in 1956 we got involved, 1966, I'm getting my periods mixed up. In the 50s we were learning and we got the airplanes and then we had to learn how to use them. In the 60s, we got to start to use them with Vietnam. And Vietnam was a continuous learning program. So the airplanes that we started Vietnam were not the airplanes. They were airplanes that we were learning on in the 50s. And once we perfected and got into the 60s, we got the airplanes we got rid of the demons, we got rid of a, a whole bunch of different aircraft, and we navigated into a precious few types. And we wound up getting rid of the planes, uh, most of the prop-driven airplanes, and we're in the, the, the new jet age. Unfortunately, when vet Vietnam came along, we were still learning how to use that jet age. And that was a period where I had made three cruises. I made my very first cruise, which was a learning cruise. And that was to go down to the Gulf of Mexico on the um, USS Lexington. Now, uh, that was an old Charlie 27 class carrier. It was prior to the Midway class and prior to the first uh, nuclear that we had, modern carrier. So we went down there with F9s and we played learn. We learned how to use the F-9s on the ship, how to use them to attack stuff. We must have attacked Pensacola 50 times, and we at attacked all the little sub-bases around there, and we attacked Florida, every Air Force base we could play with, and we learned how to use the aircraft in the, an effective manner, we thought. We also made drastic mistakes in that period of time. When we built the airplanes, we were limited on how much we could buy and how much we could use and so forth. So when I've got my first squadron, it was F-9s. Then I got uh, Gutless Cutlass. None of those were second grade aircraft. They were all fourth, they were all pre-war stuff that didn't function very well on the ships and stuff. We had to learn. But once we got into the late 50s and we started to learn things and we got the use of jets and how to use the jets and stuff, 
we were still behind the gun. That's when we got into the hot war, Cold War, with the CHICOMs, and that's when we got the Cold War with um, Vietnam. So you get into the Cor Korean War, and we're fighting the Cor Korean War with World War II basic aircraft. And they beat the hell out of us for the first six or eight months. Then we get our first jet aircraft, the TV-2s, F-84s, and we learn a little bit that those are jets and they're shorter range, less firepower, and they don't have the capability that the MiGs have, but they had the MiGs and they were running rings around us. The prop airplanes had better chance of shooting a MiG down than our two fighters that we were using over there. They were using the uh, uh, P-57, uh, which was our fastest 400 knot Air Force fighter, and the MiGs were flying rings around them. And, but at certain altitudes and certain speeds, we could put up enough of them that we could beat them. We could shoot a couple of them down, but they were winning. It wasn't until they got better jets into the fight and that wasn't until after we figured out what we were doing wrong and we got the F-4s and other fancier airplanes. The Demon didn't stand a chance. That was a 50s airplane. It didn't stand a chance. It was the F-2H. It had one big J-71 engine in it. It had multiple problems, but the only reason they took it was it was the only aircraft that had a big enough dome on the front that could hold the radar until they were able to read to build the radar into a smaller package to fit into the F-4. The Navy always wanted a tw twin engine aircraft. The reason they wanted the twin engine aircraft was it could carry two people for navigation purposes across the seas. It also had the second engine, which if they dumped their ordnance load and fuel load, they could go much further. So they could also carry a, a heavy bomb load shorter distances. So the Navy was all for double cockpit, uh, they tried to get a longer range by hanging tanks on them, 300 gallon tanks, and they even developed a way to put a tank type refueler under, it was an air to air refueler with a 50 foot hose flying out the back end of the, looked like a huge bomb 400 gallon tank or 500 gallon tank hung under the belly of a plane. The Air Force went uh, one step farther. They got a couple of uh, their transport planes and converted them, even though they were prop airplanes, they didn't get the jet airplanes till a little later. <clears throat> they put these pods on them and they put reels on them so that they would come out and they could fuel four airplanes at the same time and they had enough fuel in them that they could give up a full load to whatever planes that they were refueling. 